All right. Um, thanks, Megan. And I um, really appreciate everybody coming out for this. I know it's a, it's a full day, and but it's great to, great to see you all. And I know the rest of the team enjoyed getting to meet you. Um, as I've been spending more time in AI, one of the things that has been sort of remarkable to me is just thinking about the last couple years and just how much sort of public appreciation of science has evolved in that time. Like a couple of years ago, we were all remarking that, you know, PCR was on the front page of the New York Times. And now our parents are talking about large language models and neural networks. And I think one of the things that's really appealing about AI today is that it's actually quite accessible. Um, the kind of transformer architectures are relatively easy to understand. they are rules that we understand about how this kind of stuff works. And you know, you've got 26 letters, they make 200,000 words or so, at least in the human language, and you can assemble those into sentences that you know, with enough diversity you know, can sort of represent human understanding. Biology is also a language. You've got four base pairs in DNA, those four base pairs combined to make 64 kind of words or codons, and you can assemble those codons in, by making amino acids into proteins that follow some biochemical rules, fold up, and then that one little thing creates all this diversity of life that we see around us. But there's one really important difference. We created human language. We understand the rules. <laughs> we know what good looks like. Biology created us. And so when, you know, when we think about the last couple hundred years of biological innovation, it's really been an area of discovery, right? Scientists. Uh, you know, bread goes moldy. Hey, we've got antibiotics now. Uh, how do bacteria defend themselves? Oh, look, we just discovered restriction enzymes in CRISPR. Um, so all of this, like these major scientific breakthroughs have really been a process of discovering what nature created for us. But here at Ginkgo, we're trying to make biology engineerable. And to make this engineerable, we actually have to understand these rules. We have to understand what takes this into this. We need to understand how these things work, how they function. That's something we can do in human language. It's not something we really know how to do yet in biology. And so one of the things I'm most excited about as we think about AI is that can, we can really help us deal with the sheer complexity of this problem. It's not intractable. Like There are rules that govern this stuff. We're still living in the rules of physics and chemistry and math. But it's just so complicated that we can't look at the rules and figure it all out. And AI, with enough data, with enough compute, can really help us start making those types of advances. Now, if we think about human language, it's sort of in this interesting spot. We're really good at human language. Again, we wrote the rules. We know what good looks like. Most of us can speak it. And so interestingly, that gives us actually a really high bar for AI. It takes a lot for us to be impressed with AI. You know, most of the news articles about ChatGPT are like, huh, isn't it funny it can't add two plus two? And we feel good about ourselves because we're still smarter than AI. We get frustrated when we try to bring an AI assistant on board and it can't really replicate our tone of voice when it's writing an email for us. So it's really hard to make AI models that actually make us better. <laughs> And what's been so remarkable you know, over the last year or so is we have seen that with enough data, enough compute, these AI models are starting to do something that looks a little bit like reasoning. They're starting to connect the dots. I'd like to believe that wisdom is still the domain of humanity and not AI, but it's, it's starting to look a little bit like that. You know, this is one of my favorite examples from learning grammar as a child. Like, you can plug this in. It knows that pandas are not murderous dinner guests and that they just like bamboo. It's, it's kind of impressing. It's impressive. It's starting to impress us. I'll leave this one for you just because I still like feeling good about myself and my own wisdom. And so I tested ChatGPT on that little cartoon. And I will leave that for you for your enjoyment when you have more free time. Um, but we're here to talk about biology. So biology is more complex than human language. We don't understand all the rules. And oh, by the way, we don't all speak biology today. Only a few folks that have gotten PhDs are really capable of making the types of discoveries that are advancing the field in meaningful ways. And so we're living in a very different part of this, of this curve. And again, I would posit that AI has the potential to be really impactful here. There's a lot of data that we sometimes delude ourselves into thinking we have about biology. We've got sequence data, but I can assure you that none of you know what that sequence makes, even though it's only 613 letters long. I can even tell you what amino acids that make. I can tell you how it folds, like plug plugging in an alpha fold. You still have no idea what this protein is. No one in this room does. And I can assure you, no one at Ginkgo would be able to look at this and say, I know exactly what that protein does. What you really need is you need functional information. You need to know, where does this show up? 
is it secreted? What metabolites are created when this thing is around? What does it bind to? Where else have I seen this? And what can I deduce from that complexity, from that level of information? And this is the type of information that Ginkgo is generating every single day in service of our programs. Um, by the way, this protein is the reason we can all walk. It's the reason we have balance. Um, it literally creates little calcium crystals. It makes little rocks in your ears. It's amazing. Tiny little protein. So in, in Ginkgo's world, we are generating this kind of labeled training data, that functional data that answers the questions of what does this thing do and why, in service of the hundreds of programs that we are working on. And I can't emphasize enough the cultural shift that's happening here. When I was in your shoes about five years ago, and I was doing diligence on Ginkgo, in that case deciding to leave a cushy investing, investing job to come here, um, you know, the critique that I heard about Ginkgo was, Ginkgo just throws spaghetti at a wall and sees what sticks. You know, they're just doing brute force experimentation to figure out the result. They're not, it's not the art of biology. And now, you know, I was walking into work last week and I was listening to a podcast and you have the CTO of Bristol Myers Squibb saying, you know what, these models are saying we should put a com 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 compound together. And any of our scientists who knows anything knows that that's, that's not going to work, but we're going to do it anyway. It's still worth doing because understanding how and why that experiment fails is going to make our model better and that model is an important component of what is making us better as a company. And so he's, he's highlighting this big cultural shift, and, and I can't emphasize enough just how much we're seeing that cultural shift across our customer base. Now, because Ginkgo's been generating all this data for so long, we've been thinking about how to apply that data for AI and ML programs for many years. Um, for those of you that are new to this space, um, Josh Dunn, who's our head of DNA design at Ginkgo, wrote a great little uh, kind of summary paper on machine learning across kind of biological engineering applications uh, with some folks at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. He also is the technical lead for our NDAR program, which for those of you um, who joined our biosecurity breakout session or, or have spent any time around Matt, um, under, no, is, is part of our kind of biosecurity infrastructure around identifying uh, genetic engineering in, in bi biological samples, kind of genetic tampering, you might think of it that way. And then um, our protein engineering team is a really remarkable use case of this technology. We do protein engineering across basically every program that we do at Ginkgo. You know, each of these lines, those are, those are protein engineering programs, and each of those colors are different classes of enzymes we've had to engineer for those programs. And so the reason that we've been able to, to offer some of these like really game-changing kind of value propositions to customers, like success-based pricing, that's unheard of in our world, the reason we're able to do that is because we have now gotten so good at predicting whether or not a program is going to work and reducing the cost of doing that work in the lab through computational design, through applying these tools, um, that we're able to do something really quite different. All right. So we've talked a little bit about data, we've talked a little bit about the AI models. What I want to emphasize is that Ginkgo thinks this needs to come together. Like we will be consuming this data into our models as fast as we can create it. And there are different levels of data and there are different levels of models that matter here. And what really makes a difference in kind of next generation AI tools today is if you have a really strong foundation, so think, this tells me what proteins look like. You know, proteins that work, this is kind of what they look like. Stick just a ton of protein data in there and you've got a model that understands generally, all right, that's a protein. That's not good enough <laughs> to tell you, I need a protein that binds to this organ and doesn't create this immunogenic response and is thermostable because this is my supply chain and, 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 and. For that, you need these task-specific models. And to answer those questions, you need the kind of data that is coming out of our foundry, that labeled functional data. And so we really view this as an, in kind of an interactive process. It's the same flywheel we've been talking about for as many years as you've known us, but AI is really a tool that allows us to take advantage of all that data that we're generating, and not just the data for the successful experiments, but also the data for any experiment we do that really helps us understand how and why things work or don't work. The most common question we've been getting since we announced our Google collaboration is, all right, what models are you building first? And how much data do you need? And, and what is that data? Um, Jason mentioned at the beginning of the day that our first set of models are going to be in the protein world, so a protein foundation model and set of applications on top of that. Um, the reason for that is it's at that nice intersection of we have a lot of data and we have a lot of customer demand in that area. And so it's a great place to get started and start building the foundations. Um, but we absolutely see the value and intend to be building models across 
if you will, the central dogma of biology. Um, there is a lot of value in the work we do to understanding the rest of the genome and how, how DNA works, not just how proteins work. And then if you want to think about the data that we have that's going into these models, yes, we also benefit from discovery. There's a lot of natural genetics that are out in the world. We have a couple billion proprietary sequences at Ginkgo that we can combine with all the public databases to create a really rich data set to start training these models. But we also focus on creating diversity so that we can start testing new things that maybe aren't showing up or aren't showing up very often in nature and we can start understanding those new functions. We then can apply a whole set of measurements on that, right? What are the genetics? Um, is it being transcribed? Uh, what metabolites is it making? What proteins is it making? What are those proteins binding to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is the data that's then training all of these kind of applications that sit on top of the foundation model that we're building. I think by now you're all familiar with our Google deal, but certainly happy to speak more about it. Um, you know, we've got the data, we've, uh, we've got the sort of biological insight. Uh, what we needed, though, in, in this new world of how do you build foundation models uh, with lots of data is you need compute that'll scale with you. Um, and so we were looking for a partner that would give us that, that asset. And in the same way that we've built a scalable foundry that can you know, work on many different programs at low cost for customers. We needed the same, same asset for, for compute. Um, and so really happy with our partnership with Google there. But then what was so interesting about creating this relationship with Google was that they saw in us a couple things. One was what we've just been talking about. Ginkgo has a lot of data. And the thing they're hearing over and over from their potential customers in the life sciences is, yeah, we'd love to use AI. But we don't, like, how? You know, we don't really have enough data to make it super useful. And so it's been really hard for them, actually, to go penetrate big pharma with compute as the product. And so when they look at Ginkgo, the way they think about Ginkgo is, well, maybe compute isn't the product. Maybe Ginkgo's model is actually the product. And what we want to do is we want to help Ginkgo build better models so that Ginkgo can then help bring, you know, the Pfizer's of the world, the, the big pharma's of the world, onto AI onto the cloud via their models. And so that was really the basis for Google uh, you know, giving us funding to really accelerate the, the development of our models. Um, we announced that about a month ago. It's been a really, really great relationship getting started with them. And uh, uh, we're sort of off to the races. So that's been fun. Um, I'm going to turn it over to a panel in just a second. I'm really fortunate to have three great thinkers about in AI with me here. Um, but knowing that this is an investor day, I did just want to nod to the how do you make money in AI question. Um, obviously, this is going to be a part of our platform. Platform improves with scale. AI improves the platform. We will de deliver better value to our customers, we hope, and we will generate value in that way. But one of the reasons I'm particularly interested in spending more of my time in this space is I do think that there are new opportunities that are emerging with AI today. Uh, again, there's this kind of cultural shift happening, especially in biopharma and especially in biosecurity, thinking through what, what is our AI strategy? What is our data strategy? Who do we work with? Who helps us figure that out? And I want Ginkgo to be the partner that is helping all of these customers figure it out. And that could be how do we help create data together that helps answer these questions? And it could be how do we create models that are useful for the types of problems that you're interested in? Um, certainly, many of these models we will keep internally, um, but we do plan to release models broadly. And, and uh, you can also imagine models that we would be developing in close collaboration with, with partners as well. Um, so more to come here. I'm very, very excited about this space. Um, but wanted to give just that quick introduction um, before uh, launching our, our panel here. And so while I do introductions, um, I would invite our panelists to come up and we'll get some chairs set up here. And there will be time at the end for questions, uh, don't worry. Um, but joining me is Sham Sankar, who's uh, been on Ginkgo's board since 2015. Um, very happy he recently agreed to serve as our chairman. Um, but he's better known as the CTO of Palantir, which he joined in 2006 as the first business hire and has, as far as I can tell, led just about every function in that company at some point. And so as we've been building Ginkgo, uh, any new function we had to take on, uh, Sham has been a wealth of knowledge and experience and advice over the years. 
Um, we've got Barry Canton. Um, many of you were fortunate uh, to tour the foundry with him earlier today. Um, Barry is Ginkgo's co-founder and CTO. Um, and just a little side note, something I've noticed is like a superpower of Ginkgo's is that we have five founders, all of whom are still with the company after 15 years somehow. Um, and they all really complement each other. Um, Barry, who was the mechanical engineer of the bunch, um, he's really responsible. <laughs> <laughs> as he is fixing his microphone, for those of you who can't see that, we'll see if he can figure it out. Uh, um, uh, he actually was a mechanical engineer. That was not just a really well-timed joke. Um, he was responsible for figuring out like how we were going to make this like messy, wet, unpredictable field of biology scalable and standardized. Um, I think, honestly, we're here talking about the potential of AI at Ginkgo because of many of the decisions that Barry has made to create the framework with which we could then generate biological data at scale. Um, and then last but certainly not least, we've got Dimitri Riboy. Um, Dimitri is Ginkgo's VP of AI Enablement um, and is responsible for our long-term technical strategy in AI. Um, today, he's focused on building our AI infrastructure, optimizing our model architectures, and working with our scientific teams to design, train, and assess our AI models. Um, I found this out recently. So Dimitri has a long history of working at the intersection of biology and computation. Um, he started at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs in the late 90s, meandered through the internet boom, um, including building a lot of Twitter's data architecture. Um, and then most recently, he led the digital technology organization as CTO of Zymergen. Um, so please welcome this panel, and we'll get kicked off. All right. Um, I feel very far away from you guys. I'm going to scooch up a little bit. Um, so the first question here is, I'm going to give it to Barry and Sham. So both Palantir and Ginkgo have something called a foundry. And I think they look pretty different. Um, but I'd be curious, where did the term come from? And what does it represent to you? We'll start with you, Sean. Great. Yeah, yeah, they are, in fact, quite different. But I, I think they probably <laughs> share um, a philosophy in common. So when, you know, at Palantir, when we think of data, we see fuel, not exhaust. And that's the raw material to decisions and the decision-making process. And in really thinking about the flywheel effect you get from doing that right. You know, if you visualize an institution, it's not one decision. It's, it's kind of a chain of decisions. And anywhere you're touching and poking this pressure system, um, you have an ability to affect how the institution runs. And so you want this factory that allows you to make and produce those decisions as effectively as possible. And I think one of the things that's exciting with AIP and AI is taking that same philosophy from how do I turn data into decisions to how do I help customers build AI-enabled application forges to do that across their business. Yeah, I, I would like my answer to be um, data is fuel, uh, not exhaust as well. Uh, uh, but the, I'll, I'll add the kind of the, the, some of the ginkgo specific stuff. And I, yeah, I think a lot of what uh, Sham said applies to, to ginkgo from a, at a philosophy level and at an abstract level. Um, but to give you um, a little bit of ginkgo specific context, obviously we are a platform company. Our platform is about transforming how R&D is done uh, anywhere that biology is, is used. Um, and the, 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 the physical facility, the lab, is at the center of how R&D is, is done. Um, and we wanted to transform and continue to want to transform the vision for how that, how that works. And a part of that was to kind of establish a break and use a different name, a different term, and lay out a different vision um, uh, that kind of makes a break from the conventional notion of what a lab is. Um, and for us, the uh, foundry, you know, uh, by analogy to a semiconductor foundry, was the, the perfect uh, uh, the perfect term for us to to settle on um, at a, at a number of levels. First of all, as you heard from Jason this morning, the the separation of the physical activity activity of the R and D from the design activity um, is something is a, is a, a separation that we wanted to create and that wasn't really present at all in the in the life sciences um, uh, when we started building all of this. Once you have that separation, now you can start to um, uh, have a lot of design activities centralize on a, a shared general purpose, um, a physical platform for doing the for doing the work. The foundries that we toured um, this morning, and you get all kinds of operational efficiencies from doing that. Um, further, once you centralize it, you can start to uh, uh, automate it. You can increase the operationalization. Um, it becomes capital intensive. It becomes all of, all of the things that that semiconductor um, uh, fabs are. Um, and we see a lot of analogies there that we want to that we are continuing to push after. Um, so yeah, great term from our perspective for what we're trying to do. Appreciate it. Um, all right, Dimitri, 
Um, when you were at Lawrence Berkeley in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, again, I found this out recently, it's been fun, um, you know, the people you work with clo most closely, you don't know them uh, until you introduce them for a panel. Uh, you developed something called the Vista Genome Browser 2.0. What was that, and could you predict then what we would be doing at the intersection of computation and biology 20, 25 years later? The internet remembers. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I then took like a more than a decade off of uh, biotech and went into consumer internet. Um, <laughs> so <y> <laughs> <laughs> I came back. <laughs> I came back. Um, so the, uh, it was the second version of the Vista Genome Browser, obviously. <laughs> Uh, the Vista Genome Browser was, this was happening when, so I was an undergrad uh, and I just happened to get a programmer job, I was looking for, you know, pay my, my tuition uh, at Eddie Rubin's lab in LBL and uh, that was right around the time when the Human Genome Project was just about to finish and then I was there as it published, uh, both of them published, uh, and a lot of other sequences started coming online. So you got human, you got uh, monkey, you got pig, and then you started getting microbes uh, and all kinds of things. So there's this explosion of data that was just coming at a very different pace than uh, the field had been used to. And that was before NGS came along, uh, next generation sequencing. Uh, and uh, people were doing a lot of uh, very interesting comparative genomics, um, compare the human genome to the mouse genome, find areas uh, of the genome that are very similar, get the multiple genome alignment, um, and that tells you where, where the genes are, right? Like that was a problem. Uh, figure out what's conserved between uh, through evolution. Uh, and so it turned out that uh, the actual genome browser was like a, a Java applet, if you remember those. <laughs> uh, JavaScript wasn't quite, quite right yet. Um, uh, for providing uh, the results of these alignments to, uh, to scientists uh, across the US uh, who could kind of navigate them and look at them. But behind that was the more interesting part to me, which was um, how do you actually get those alignments? Because now we were at a place where the data was way too big for us to do it the way people were used to doing it. So we had to get into distributed computing. Um, we literally built a rack, like a wire rack, not if you've seen server racks, they don't look like wire racks anymore. Uh, it was a literal rack like you've seen around here with beige boxes on it all wired together in a literal broom closet. We had to keep the door open so it wouldn't get too hot. Um, uh, and so we built all that up and wrote up a bunch of software to have these things talk to each other so that we could run these alignments. And so that was kind of my introduction to distributed computing and to what became known as big data. Um, and then that actually set me on the path of doing big data for internet companies. They have a lot of data and eventually for, for returning here. So could you predict then what we're doing now? Right, the second part of the question. <laughs> um, I think because it was I think it was the seeds of what we're doing now. It was right at the point where things leapt into data is much bigger, uh, it doesn't fit on a single computer, and all of these problems that were before kind of more pure science problem, lab problems, became, oh my god, like we really have to do a lot of computational analysis of this data, and that's how we're gonna move the field forward. Uh, so it was a seed, maybe an acorn, and now we're like in oak territory, and with AI we're heading into sequoias and beyond. Uh, but there were glimpses. All right, Sham. So the last 12 mon months have really, I think, like rocked the world of a lot of corporations who are all kind of struggling to figure out, okay, like what do we do about AI? Didn't think AI was relevant for them before, but suddenly they're feeling the basis of competition sort of change under their feet. I would guess Palantir sometimes sees this coming um, before the rest of the world does. And so I'm curious how you think about product development in a world where your customers might not necessarily know what they, what they need and what they want. Do you approach it like, hey, we know best and we're gonna develop the product that's right? Or do you find that it's still a, a very kind of collaborative and consultative product project? That's like the hardest question, because I think the answer is that you have to find a way of doing both. You have to both meet the customer where they are today and what they understand. But if you haven't already developed meaningful conviction in what you think they're gonna need two years, five years from now, then you know it's not actually gonna work. 
and the way that we've squared this, what I'm quite excited about with this, and part of this I think is just that people now have an expectation that software is supposed to work fast. If you just take that as a rebaselining of the amount of energy people are putting into this, what we've really seen work now is getting people with their hands on their keyboard. This is not the sort of problem or technology that you can admire and think your way through. Like you have to actually experience it and iterate with it. So like getting multiple customers in a room for a week to actually build something where they're gonna exit that boot camp with something they can put in production has been so efficacious. Because I can scream until I'm blue in the face that like chat is a limiting paradigm and not how you should be thinking about applying this in the enterprise. That LLMs are statistics, not calculus, or any of these like deductive frames and it's just like, okay, conceptually maybe interesting, maybe. But really it's like, oh, I just built something that saved my users 50% of their time in a day. Like it, you, they get it. And so I think squaring those two things is, is the art of this. Barry, maybe turning to you. Uh, we talked just in the introduction a little bit, just at the highest level, the difference between foundation models and task-specific applications. And so as we think about building product at Ginkgo, you know, either for our own internal use, for our scientists, or you know, more broadly, where are we spending our time and how are we thinking about uh, the technology that our customers and our, our scientists are gonna need? Well, I think the answer is that we have to work on both of those things. Um, so as has always been true in the history of Ginkgo, we have to think about the, the platform, and then as Sham said, we have to think about meeting the, the, the customers where they are today and helping solve the, the problems that they have today. Um, and so the way I think about the, the foundation models that we're building is analogous to the, the foundry that we've been building and the code base that we've been accumulating. It's a general purpose asset that gets better with scale. Um, uh, and the, the, the more broadly useful it is, the, the, better, it will, the better it will get. Um, so we are absolutely using the data that we already have access to, um, both, both public data but also the proprietary data that we have to train foundation models that we hope will be broadly useful across um, markets and, and, pro and projects. Um, second, on the on the task specific model side, um, the you know our our our, uh, our our partners have very specific needs. They need a particular protein to be more active or more soluble or expressed at a higher at a higher level, or they need a promoter that has greater tissue specificity. What you know, whatever it might be, these are very specific problems. And to solve those, it is not sufficient to have a foundation model. You need to have a task specific model that can address those um, particular uh, questions. To be able to build a task-specific model, you need um, relevant data. You need data with the right kinds of, of labels, um, uh, tissue specificity um, labels for promoter sequences, for, for example, um, stability data for, for proteins. If you think about our foundry, what we've been building here is a way to generate labeled data sets uh, for very particular problems that are commercially relevant, and we've been working on doing that now for, for 15 years. Um, so we have the engine and we have the capability um, to, to collect data to train fine-tuned models, and so we'll absolutely do that to um, uh, help solve customers' problems today. Um, and the last thing I wanna say is I would like to zoom out a, a, li a little bit um, because uh, while there's a, an enormous amount we can do with better modeling of protein and, and DNA using the, um, the, the language models that are emerging um, um, over the last couple of years, to some extent, the most powerful thing in biology are, are, are cells. You know, these are fully featured little machines that can do incredible things and that self-replicate each other and that we can't, you know, we can't build with any other, any other technology. Uh, I think the language model tools that, that we're all able to use today are gonna make it easier to understand and um, program cells at the cellular level, but I don't think they're gonna be sufficient. We're gonna need better AI tools and we're gonna need to be able to integrate mechanistic modeling techniques in order to be able to um, uh, model and predict at the, at the cellular or tissue level. And that's where a lot of the, the, um, uh, the true value in the future is going to be. Um, proteins and uh, um, uh, small molecules and, and, and DNA level work can be extremely valuable today, but I think the, the broader potential of this technology is gonna be at the, the cellular and tissue level, and we're gonna need to do a lot of new things on the modeling side and on the data collection side to be able to enable those. Sounds like a lot of complicated, messy data. Uh, Dimitri, yes. you have spent <laughs> the last 25 years or so working on lots of complicated, messy data. Um, 
how do you think about building the infrastructure for Ginkgo that can handle that complexity, that diversity? What allows us to start thinking about those bigger questions that Barry is outlining? Yeah. Um, you have to be thoughtful about the foundation. I, I don't mean the foundation model, but the foundation of the foundation model. <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, there's a lot of engineering that goes into sort of the, uh, the, the enabling those things. That's why my title is ena uh, enablement. That's the, that's the tricky problem. <laughs> um, uh, so organizing the data, making sure the data is captured in the right ways, the data is relevant, uh, you can actually interpret it later, you can uh, look at your models and find out where the data that went into those models came from. Um, you can uh, figure out when uh, your uh, results are off and you can build a f feedback loop. Um, and that's all kind of abstracted from what exactly is the data? Is it the data from the LCMS? Is it the data from our, our HCS screens? Uh, and then how do you organize um, that information uh, so that it can provide appropriate input to a model that sort of fundamentally um, you don't want to over specify to the individual types of, uh, of, of input so there's a there's a lot of mess in there fortunately to some extent this new um, uh, paradigm for how we build AI models it lets you get away with a fair amount of mess right like human language is messy images are messy and yet we're able to extract meaning out of them um, uh, so in the in the models really shine in sort of one uh, uh, a domain that's very expressive. You can express pretty much anything with language, that's what we do. Um, uh, images are very expressive, right? So that's a very good kind of problem for these models where it's something that's very, uh, very expressive and very complex, right? But there is an internal structure to it, it's not random. Uh, and they're able to uh, elucidate that structure internally. Um, and that's the kind of data we're dealing with in biology and that's why uh, fundamentally we think this, this is gonna work. So I think we, we biologists like to think we're special and, and, and feeling like data is, is all that matters and, and you know, it's, it's the big hard problem. Sham, do you run into the data problem in your world? And, and if so, what does that look like? Yeah, I, I think one of the exciting things about um, the, the current approach with LLMs in particular in the enterprise is that there's all sorts of data that nobody used to even think was economical to capture that you now can. And and part of this is actually elucidated by trying to solve problems. So if you are trying to use something like retrieval augmented generation to service very high end equipment to automate and build a co-pilot for maintenance, the first thing you're gonna go to is like the maintenance manuals. Except the reality is those 10,000 page PDF documents are wildly out of date, no one maintains them, and you, you kind of have to mark to market as soon as you try using them that it doesn't actually have the source of truth. But you know what does have the source of truth? The Slack rooms, the JIRA tickets, the audio recordings of the video conference calls you're using in your incident response to debug these things. That is otherwise historically treated as ephemeral and useless data that is unstructured and irrelevant but it's actually completely trivial to structure now, and it is actually the most relevant data. In fact, all the canonical historical sources are known to be inaccurate. And so if you kind of string this together where it's not just how do I solve the end part of this, but what are the new sorts of data that actually ha are much higher fidelity but historically harder to capture, you get a lot of value. And I suspect there would be analogy there um, to the sorts of data you're able to capture through the foundry. You agree, Bear? Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think th that that is absolutely true for us. Um, a lot of the a lot of the insights, a lot of the interpretation ha have been treated as as being ephemeral, and and now they can be integrated with the kind of the harder, more structured data, and that's exciting. Um, actually, one of the things that Dimitri is working on is how to how to um, surface and structure that information to make it easier to get at. So. Several, several <laughs> those, yes. All right, so um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, Sham, this one's this is still for you. So you spend a lot of time working with government customers. Um, we obviously have a biosecurity business also working with, with that type of customer. How do you see them thinking about AI? Um, are they viewing it more as a threat or an opportunity? And, and how, how, how do we build that trust? I think uh, folks in government, thinking is the right word. They're doing a lot of thinking about AI and, and maybe not as much acting on it. Uh, I think that's created a lot of opportunity for companies that are incorporating this into their products. So just taking ground, manifesting the facts on the ground by rolling out their products that incorporate these things. But 
it speaks to the underlying reality that AI is this experiential technology. You're not going to be able to think your way through it, and the advantage is going to accrue to the people who are experimenting most rapidly with it. So I don't want to paint the government in broad brushstrokes. So there are pockets of deep innovation where people are going fast, but by and large, there's a lot of admiring how exquisitely interesting the problem is, and and not enough hands on keyboard. Yeah. Well, I think you know, at least when I when I hear folks talking about the dangers of AI. Biology is often one of the things that they bring up, right? Like, well, wh what happens when we can start messing with biology? It's a, it's sort of a touchy subject. So, Barry, you know, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on just, you know, these concerns that we sometimes hear about the risks of moving too fast in AI, especially as it relates to biology. And, and so, how do you think about reconciling the, the huge opportunities? You know, as I think about biology, it is probably the only technology that can deal with hunger and health and climate in a, in a real scalable way. Um, but with you know the, the potential for misuse or, or risk. Yeah, I think you know why we started Ginkgo and, and why all of us are, are are still here is because of that potential to solve global scale challenges with with biology. Um, so I, I would say that in the in the biological domain, uh, we have 50 years of history now of dealing with um, really kind of monumental breakthroughs that have raised questions of biosafety and security. And so I actually think the community um, uh, has spent a lot of time wrestling with those questions and, and thinking about them, going all the way back to the, um, uh, the discovery of recombinant DNA in the 70s, uh, the publication of the human genome, the discovery of CRISPR, um, the, you know, we've been, you know, the deployment of, of engineered um, uh, crops. Uh, these are questions that, that society and, and experts have, have, have worked through. Um, are the systems perfect? Are the regulations perfect? Uh, obviously, obviously not. Would we like things to move faster? Obviously, um, the, but we do have a kind of a multi-layered um, uh, protection system in, in place. Uh, everything from the level of um, uh, DNA synthesis screening to um, uh, labs being able to operate to, uh, through um, the the uh, controls around how how engineered biology is is deployed. So um, I think we have a lot going in, in our favor. I think it's 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 really gratifying to hear um, every time I hear from Matt about the progress on the biosecurity side because I think that's like filling a huge, a huge gap. Um, also on the biology side, we've, we've spent a lot of time wrestling with what data it makes sense to have in the public domain versus um, uh, to be kept uh, uh, private, both from, a, um, both from a commercial perspective, but also from a, from a biosafety per perspective. So I see AI as being an accelerant here to what we're able to do, um, but I, I think that we have, um, I, we've been working on a lot of these questions for a long time um, uh, with other scientific breakthroughs, and I think that you know, we'll, the, we will be able to use a lot of that in this case, too. Yeah. Well, one of the things I think is sort of most interesting as we think about this problem is some of the same things that we think about purely for commercial reasons, right? How do we protect our IP? How do we protect our data? How do we protect our insights? Are the same types of questions I think you need to wrestle with when you're also thinking about kind of these security implications, you know, biosecurity, it's still, you know, how do you, how do you regulate access? How do you regulate, you know, data, et cetera. Um, and so it, it feels like we have a sort of a unique place in the world just by virtue of the way that we've built the business to try to wrestle with with a lot of these these hard challenges. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think the way the commercial incentives will line up is, is that it's fast moving commercial entities working with proprietary um, data and data generation platforms that are gonna make the most progress. I think efforts to build large federated public databases are gonna run into all kinds of misaligned incentives and uh, structural problems and will just move very slowly and the, the, the speed and the progress will come from commercial entities operating in a kind of an agile and focused way. Um, the, um, the other point I, I, I forgot to mention uh, before is um, with biology, unlike, um, say, um, uh, software, um, the, even if we said, hey, we're going to, you know, slow down technology, we're going to try to somehow use um, uh, social, cultural, and political um, uh, approaches to slow down the rate of technology change, Evolution is out there, you know, running billions of experiments <laughs> every day, finding it's sort you know, of humbling, isn't it? Right. Yeah. It's, what's you know, the, what's the foundry throughput of it's, Mother Nature? <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's 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 huge, right? And it's just doing penetration testing every day, right, against our immune <laughs> our immune systems. Um, and so the the, pay, the 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 cost of inaction, the risk of inaction, is is just really high, I think, yeah. in this area. So. 
Um, all right, so I uh, want to keep an eye on time, and I don't have a watch, so I'm really probably failing at doing that. Um, I do want to leave some some time open for questions, so um, I've got a little rapid fire for the for the crowd here just to warm things up. But if you do have questions, I think we'll bring a mic around, so so please get those ready in your head. All right, rapid fire. We're just going to go down the list. You have 10 seconds or less. I mean it. All right, favorite use case for ChatGPT. Mine is bedtime stories for my kids. Lord of the Rings limericks to celebrate Palantir anniversaries. <laughs> <laughs> I can't possibly read books fast enough, and I need AI to help me go faster. Uh, recipes, but uh, you have to be mindful of the amounts that it gives you. So, All right, it's we'll only for advanced users. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go the other direction now, Dimitri. You start. All right. Most surprising thing about our lives. I don't know. Thirty years from now. Um, Somehow, Twitter managed to survive 17, at 17 attempts to uh, <laughs> disintegrate and it's still around. X, you mean, I think. <laughs> Might get renamed, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Ginkgo's business model will be a completely logical and obvious thing, and everyone will look back and say that made total sense. So, yeah. <laughs> Too soon! <laughs> <laughs> that we're going to really miss being able to talk to everyone in real time to our friends oh. in Mars. Okay. Oh. All right. All right. Yeah. All right uh, Sean, you start. All right. Name a task that AI, or I'll give you AI plus robots, will never be able to perform as well as a human. Dance as awkwardly as me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, caring, but uh, Dimitri, is, I think I've heard Dimitri talk about this. It's great. <laughs> oh, uh, I think AI will never be able to wrap its neural networks around a child crying desperately about wanting cereal for breakfast <laughs> while there's a bowl of cereal <laughs> right in front of them. <laughs> I think AI might do better than me at that job. But, but <laughs> right, 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 right. All right, uh, Dimitri, you're starting on this one. What's the most amusing AI mistake or misunderstanding that you have witnessed? Uh, I I try to self chat GPT uh, or how do you I don't know what the term is we're gonna come up with one um, looked myself up uh, and it thought that <laughs> I'm uh, Chip Huen who is uh, a really prolific author of like ML <laughs> stuff so I'm glad that we are in the same vector space <laughs> uh, but I'm definitely not as cool as her. <laughs> Uh, every interaction I have with Siri is unfortunately challenging. So. I did say chat GPT, but I'll oh, give it to you. GPT. All right, Sean. Oh. I have to occasionally just do math problems to remind myself that I'm, I'm still good for something. Two plus two? <laughs> yeah. All right, last one. What will you do when AI can do your job? Easy. I'm going to go look for John Connor and join the resistance. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that sounds right. I was going to go with find Morpheus, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you can go with John Connor too. I took it to a dark place. Uh, <laughs> I've been working myself out of jobs for 25 years, and it's still rolling. So <laughs> I, it'll it'll be cool. It'll be fine. Um, uh, I might ask AI to ch teach me uh, calligraphy. I think that'll be really fun to take up in my old age. I've learned so much about Dimitri in this panel. Um, I don't know how much time we have, but for whatever amount of time we have. Oh, great. Lots of time. I was doing so well. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to run around with the mic and take some of those questions. Yeah. Grab my mic. Um, so the... You're good. So the the comment of data is fuel, absolutely agree. And obviously, that's you know one of the wonderful things that you guys have built. But compute is still a part of the equation. Um, just because there's there's presumably large amounts of things that can be brute forced, um, figuring out which information is the most useful, the associations between it. If you were to think about your business and you had access to all of the compute <coughs> available in the world today, how would that supercharge what you could do and how should we think about that? Um. I, I can I can start. Um, I mean, I, I, for me, it, it comes back to um, uh, the the fact that we we a we need better data and we need more of it. I think just having more compute than we have right now, I don't think it would actually be. I think we have we have a lot of compute available to us uh, now. Um, uh, so we need we need better data. Um, the we we need to internally at Ginkgo we we have some expertise and capability building to to do here. Um, I think we are good users of AI today. I don't think we are good developers of the fundamental technology, and we need to get 
we need to get better at that and are, are, are working hard on that um, at, the, at the moment. Um, the, and, and then I think the last thing is, I think it's still pretty early in the, um, the development of, of uh, model architectures and the breadth of problems they can be applied to and how to integrate multimodal data to, together. And that is, um, that's all hard thinking work rather than just computing work. And uh, that's I think where I think we need to focus. So, but Ed, Dimitri. Yeah, yeah uh, I think the Google deal in, uh, in large was specifically about that uh, because so basically, my answer to you is nothing different than what we're doing now, because that was why we did the Google deal, to get effectively unlimited com compute as far as as far as far our ability to consume it goes. I'm sure I'll be singing a different tune in like three years, and I'll say, I need more compute, like give me more budget, Anne-Marie. But, uh, <laughs> but for now, like the strategy, th this is why we did it. We want as much compute as we can eat, uh, and, and that's what we got. So this is what we would be doing. And I would just say that you know it, all of the advancements of Gen AI don't change what problems are valuable to solve. The same problems are valuable to solve. You can just go much faster with it. So what do you do with more compute? You go faster against the things you know are already valuable. You spend less time optimizing. Uh, so do you guys, you know, do you see tech companies becoming, you know, a, I guess a long-term partner in the drug discovery space or with their investments, you know, increasing Google with isomorphic labs, for example, do you see them kind of sneaking their way into being a potential competitor in the space? So just to repeat the question for the, um, for folks uh, online, the, the question there was how do we think about, um, uh, the relationship with the tech companies going going forward are they are they a partner are they are they a competitor um, the you know I think we'll I, I think we'll we'll see um, no doubt they are building um, very useful technology and capacity today and, and infrastructure and there's obvious opportunities to partner and we'll, we'll continue to do so in the in the mode of the the, the Google deal that we that we announced um, the what they're commitment to um, making biology easier to engineer will be in the future is 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 un unknown right um, I think most of the efforts that they have had in in those areas so far are um, like kind of more like si side efforts right not central to the core the core game by by any means um, um, so I think you know I'm glad they've they have they have uh, done those projects I'm glad AlphaFold e exists um, the I'm glad ESM exists uh, and and we'll look to leverage those um, advancements where where we where we can um, but uh, I think um, you know, I think we we need to make sure that we're building the platform for making biology easier to engineer. I think we're the we are the mission-driven company in this in this space here, um, and so we're going to be the ones who are going to make the investments that that have to be made for for um, uh, to achieve our mission. And uh, to the extent that that aligns with what the big tech companies uh, care about, um, that's fantastic. But they, you know, we we don't know where that where their focus will be. So. Yeah, I'd probably just say, like, I think on the one hand, like, these are also just really hard problems. Um, and so I, I do think sort of to Barry's point, like, we will benefit from investments that others are making and technologies that are generally useful to understand biology. Um, I think also to, to Barry's point, the, the nuance I'd make is a couple fold. One is we tend to see when tech companies are getting interested in biology, because it's such a kind of complex, intractable seeming problem, they focus in on a, a relatively narrow domain, and it becomes very, very rational then to also say, okay, let me let me solve, let me solve a very narrow problem, let me make a drug. Um, and so most of the companies that we see that have come out of this um, sort of tech background are, are really therapeutics companies. Um, and, and again, those are those are companies that we think we could support. Um, and, and you know, one of the most common questions we get is how do you deal with the data grounding problem in biology? And, and for those of you who don't spend as much time in, in AI, basically how do you make sure your, <laughs> what your AI is training on and spitting out means anything at all? And, and the way that you know that is you have a foundry that can actually test the things that are coming out of, out of your model and, and you're constantly reinforcing your model in that way. And, and that's not an area where we've just seen that much interest candidly um, from those companies in building that type of infrastructure in-house. And in fact, when we were talking to Google in the early days of putting this partnership together, I think one of the things that they really appreciated was 
a, a gap that the DeepMind team has historically had is exactly that. You know, they, they've built absolutely incredible technologies that we use regularly at Ginkgo, but what, what sort of got them ooing and eyeing was, oh, if, if our model spits out a thousand predictions, you, you can actually go run those pretty trivially and let us know how the model did. And that's just not a capability that they have or, or candidly that I think they really want to, to have in-house. It's just, it's not the area of highest ROI for them. Thanks. Any other questions from the crew? I've got a couple more I can throw in. Can you talk about um, your new role and um, Ginkgo specifically, how you're thinking about, I mean, you've done a good time talk, a good job talking about AI and the science, but structurally, how, how, you know, how are you thinking about um, this across all the platforms and um, talk a little bit more about that from an operational standpoint. Yeah, sure. So the question is really around how are we organizing around AI? Um, and so I think, again, maybe just uh, going back to one thing I said earlier, I think at, at the core, AI is, is a tool. AI is a tool that we will use as broadly as possible to make our platform stronger. Um, at the same time, I think we've all recognized that there are real new business opportunities for Ginkgo to be a thought partner to our largest customers, to our government partners in figuring out AI as, as, as a strategy. Um, and and that, that requires a little bit of flexibility outside of our, our normal kind of commercial program uh, structure. And so we wanted to create the, the flexibility to explore, explore those opportunities because I do think you know, Ginkgo wants to be the place where you come to figure out hard biological problems. Um, and, and I think, again, AI will, will at its core, and, and the models that we're building that right now are really designed to support our broader platform. Um, but we did want to create a little bit more focus at the commercial level to open up some of those larger kind of strategic partnerships and opportunities. Any other questions? Yeah, we've got one more here. On that point, and also your question of what would you do when when AI replaces you, um, you know, a lot of, of engineers in the, the low code, no code world are actually being la laid off. And I I'm the optimist that thinks those people who are you know very intelligent are going to move towards harder problems, of which healthcare is one of the hardest and most important problems that we can think of. Have you started to see that major shift where that population is expressing a lot more interest in the cross themes of AI and healthcare? And how do you expect that to change the talent pool and your recruiting capabilities going forward? Um, I'm not sure about the sort of low code, no code uh, uh, tailwinds uh, for that. Uh, I haven't explored exactly uh, the, the full pipeline. Um, but I would say that earlier and now still, uh, there's a healthy amount of interest in uh, among engineers uh, across the board uh, in <coughs> tackling prob problems that matter uh, and moving away from sort of getting a incremental improvement and add click throughs and into things that actually affect people's lives. Uh, no offense to anybody here who is investing in. Uh, the ad techs of the world. Um, that's what brought me back. Says Dimitri, who <laughs> built Twitter's data architecture. Uh, right. I'm I'm fairly uh, fairly intimately familiar with that problem, um, and uh, w there's no shortage of interest in solving really hard problems and working on things that matter. Uh, so. Uh, it is, yeah. it is interesting when we when we announced the Google partnership. I got a couple notes from folks at Google who weren't part of our collaboration, just saying. The Google internal, you know, kind of chats and 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 conversations just completely lit up when this uh, partnership was announced because they were just so excited to be able to work on problems that that do have the potential for like real impact that 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 we're focused on. Um, they, you know, there's been competition on who gets to work on Ginkgo's, uh, you know, Ginkgo's collaboration within Google, and so that has definitely been really encouraging to see. Although there's definitely still a war on AI talent that you know I think we all we all face. Yeah, we definitely have people who are like have the freedom to uh, pick their projects at Google. Uh, I'm seeing a few of those people show up in in our in our meetings. Uh, great panel. Um, maybe one for Barry. Um, obviously, the Google Google partnership is a multi-year collaboration. 
Um, I'd be curious, how should we measure your progress against that? Um, obviously, seeing new programs is certainly one obvious way. Um, you know, is there one particular major uh, contract that you think you could sign, perhaps with a pharma company, that would validate the investment in the AI? So obviously, the Google partnership does come with uh, a meaningful cost. So I'm just curious how quickly you think you can prove that the cost certainly justifies the commitment. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, and we, um, I, it's something we're we're thinking about a lot I internally. I mean, I think the the way we see the power of AI today for for us um, is compressing R and D timelines and reducing the cost of R and D projects. So compressing R and D timelines by allowing us to eliminate entire cycles of, of um, experimental cycles of design, build, and test. Um, reducing R&D budgets both by, by that first factor, but, but also allowing us to look at uh, potentially smaller numbers of um, uh, individual designs within a particular round of, of, of testing. So, um, you know, 500 designs instead of, instead of 1,000 designs, 500 designs instead of 10,000 designs. Um, so um, we think all of those uh, those factors will shorten R&D timelines, um, reduce the budgets for projects. So you'll see things, you know, like success-based pricing for particular deals will become easier through the use of technologies like this. Um, it's, it's certainly possible that, that um, uh, through the adoption of this technology, there will be new categories of deals that are enabled, and Anna Marie was, was talking about that at the, at the end of um, uh, her, her opening remarks. Um, so we'll, we'll, see where that, we'll see where that goes. Um, that's obviously an exciting par part of this, so yeah. Um. All right, I think we have, we have time for one more question. I've got one in case nobody else does. All right, I've got one. This has been a topic that is just absolutely fascinating to me, and maybe we can just get a quick take, Barry and Sham, from each of you. Um, we're seeing some really interesting debates about IP in the world of, of AI, um, and IP is, has you know, been a sort of constant theme in, in biotech land especially. Um, how do you expect that to evolve, this kind of IP copyright debate? Um, can AI drugs be patented, for example? Uh, I, can, I, can, I, I can start. Um, so, so I think primarily we'll see AI as, acceler as accelerating the development of, uh, of, of IP. Um, our, our understanding is that it's somewhat of a, a settled legal question that um, uh, an AI cannot invent a, a drug by itself, um, the, the, or cannot patent, a, um, uh, cannot patent a, a drug by itself. There's, it's, gonna, it's gonna require human enablement. Um, I think it, the reality in, in our field in biology is that there needs to be human enablement anyway, um, and so I, it's, it's kind of a moot point. I think um, the, the, uh, there will continue to be um, uh, people driving the innovation, supported by AI, I think, you know, co-pilots essentially for, 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 for invention. So um, maybe it's gonna accelerate and, and change who some of the players are um, in, in generating IP, but I, I, it's not yet clear that the rules of the game are going to change. Um, the patent office is certainly looking at how they can foster AI-enabled um, uh, in, invention. Um, so we're watching that, but too early to say if anything is going to, um, is gonna come out of that yet. The other big problem that's happening obviously in consumer tech is that the models are getting trained with uh, a huge mass of data, some of which may well be or is copy uh, is copyrighted. Um, we don't really run into that problem. The model, the data that we're using to train our models is, e is either um, publicly non-copyrighted data um, that, or it's proprietary data that we have generated or we've generated with our partners. And so we, we, we're kind of able to sidestep a lot of those kind of um, challenges that are being wrestled with in the in the consumer space at the moment. And I, I, everything I, I'm seeing agrees with what Barry's saying there. I would say that in practice, obviously the technology is so powerful, but empirically at the coalface, all the value comes from an elegant integration of generative AI with human thought and traditional software. And so it is a moot point in the sense that the things that will be created are gonna have some sort of complicated mix. Okay. Um, well, appreciate everyone again coming to join us. I think we have a Q&A session uh, with the, the whole executive team scheduled right now. So we'll take just a couple minutes to get everybody in the room and, and rearranged and, and be back with you shortly. Thanks, everyone.